czekamy Was ponownie po przerwie obiadowej. Następnym prelegentem będzie Klaus Knoper. O czym opowie, to myślę, że sami zobaczycie. Przywitajmy go gorącymi brawami. Okay, test, test, seems to work. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, my Polish is still not good enough to give the full talk in Polish as I kind of announced last year, so uh, I hope you can cope with me still speaking in English. I'm aiming for next year for the Polish talk. So um, I'm talking about a very difficult topic. In fact, this was the most difficult talk for me ever because I'm not talking about installing software, but about removing software and still have a working system. So, um, yeah, and the dropouts are probably not caused by system D, but uh, if you plug too many adapters together, this just happens. So uh, don't worry about that. Yeah, um, system D uh, has already taken its place in the Linux um, distros. All the major distros are using it, so um, it's kind of mute to talk about how, if we should it or if we shouldn't. Um, it's already there, and uh, most distros uh, are happily adopting all the new features that I'm also going to talk about. Um, but, uh, well, Systemd has also some problems for distros like Knopix, and of course I'm trying to address that as well. First I will give an overview about what's different with Systemd versus the Sys5 in it that uh, we originally used, and then I will do some experiments uh, of removing Systemd from Lubuntu, which res will result in a more or less broken system sometimes, and sometimes it will work a little better, and hopefully at the end we get a version without Systemd that actually works. Okay, so in the beginning, uh, most of you will still remember this, there was a simple startup procedure. You gave one startup program as the initial command to the Linux kernel, Linux init equals uh, sbin init, for example, and this was the first process of your system, and via an easy-to-use configuration, etc init tab, your entire system was uh, brought up and uh, configured. Some services start sequentially, waiting for each other, that's uh, the wait option, or do auto restart like the X server. Once you log out, you automatically get a new session, get logged in, and uh, this was the respawn option. Everything else was done by shell scripts, not by init itself, um, and these were residing in etc init.d or etc rc.d. This is the configuration I'm still using for Knopix. Um, as you can see, it's not the normal Sys5 init startup. All the run levels are commented out at the beginning, so I don't have uh, that sequence that's normal for Debian, like mounting file systems, starting network services, doing this and that, one arch after each other, but uh, only a single shell script called Knopix Autoconfig. Yeah, you can see that here. And this shell script does all the work of detecting the hardware, starting services, and uh, bringing the system up. After this is run, which uh, should be quite a few seconds, uh, we have the logins at the four initial consoles, the FTTY 1 to 4, and on the fifth console, the X server is starting and you can log in graphically. So, uh, if you start Knopix, that's usually what happens, and uh, I'm just running this as a test right now. So, we have a comparison. Okay, watch the clock. It starts five seconds before the full minute. What you see here is the very reduced startup sequence of this 5 in it using the configuration that you just have seen. Um, all the hardware detection is uh, already done now, and now the graphical system starts up. And once we reached the menu, it's about, well, let's say 30 seconds have passed. So this is quite fast, I think, even for Sys5 in it, just by circumventing the normal startup sequence. 
Okay, the next level would be starting on a very small system like a Raspberry Pi. This is one of my next projects, Knopix on Raspberry Pi. Here, this is five init sequence, looks like this. Even smaller. We have no run levels anymore, just one auto config again for the very tiny hardware detection because on the Raspberry Pi and other ARM based architectures, you don't actually need hardware detection. And uh, the X server is respawning, so if you leave X, it will start again, and there's also a shutdown sequence, and uh, you have a s one serial console uh, on the three GPIO pins of the Raspberry Pi. Now, um, this, is, uh, this was Sys5 in it. tries to make things better than Sys5 in it. Um, reasons are Sys5 in it is quite old software. It was designed for very small systems, very um, low profile, very few complexity. Script based sequential, be uh, sequential booting is kind of slow if you follow the normal system 5 init boot sequence with about 9,000 programs that have to be started from the beginning until you reach the desktop and some of them end immediately. Um, this is quite slow. <laughs> Services and mounts are now so-called units and can be parallelized in a very fine-grained way. So each run level, each service is configurable with its own config file. And some standard services that are present in almost any Unix system, like the system logger, syslogd, um, dbus, and udev are present in uh, systemd as well, integrated seamlessly. So you don't have to install all, all these services, but just one package. Also, systemd makes heavy use of Linux-specific features such as namespaces and can therefore enhance security and enable many more things than Knopix has, and we can compare the startup process. Okay, so we start at uh, 30 seconds. Frankly, I don't know what it's doing at that point. Um, I removed the splash screen so you can see at the, from the moment where systemd is uh, starting its services, um, but uh, what it's doing in the first 15 seconds, I have no idea. This is still from the kernel. Now the systemd socket start and uh, yeah, by the brackets, you can see all the services are started in parallel. It doesn't wait until they are, uh, they are ended or finished. Now the X server starts, hopefully. <laughs> okay, and uh, that's about uh, 45 seconds. So, yeah, almost, almost as fast as Knopix, I would say. Um, have you parallelized um, startup sequence by systemd? Okay, I'm already opening a shell because we will do some experiments during the talk. Yeah. Now let's have a look at uh, the quite complex system. The system um, parts of the kernel are control groups, um, lib capabilities. Crypt setup, TCP wrapper, lib audit, lib notify. Systemd makes heavy use of all these libraries. The core of Systemd um, consists of the system manager and uh, services, timers, mounts, targets. All of them have different configuration files. Systemd calls these services units. Um, you have to get used to that uh, naming convention of Systemd. Uh, for login, multi seed, inhibit, session, and PAM. We'll have a look at that uh, later, too. And uh, the namespaces are a very practical feature. You can uh, start services inside a box that cannot leave that sandbox. So you can do kind of uh, pseudo virtualization already inside system D and lock processes against each other. They will never see each other's files. So, for example, each individual user has his own TMP directory and cannot see temporary files of other users. That's also a security feature. The systemd daemons are on a different slide, so I don't have to uh, look up right here. Systemd's new functions, um, the systemd authors already said systemd is not one service. 
It's actually a suite of 69 individual programs. Systemd does a massively parallelized startup of system services. And uh, this is done via dependencies. So every process that requires a mount or a sub-process will wait until that other process is started and systemd tries to figure out the optimal sequence to start sequentially or in parallel. Also, a few security enhancements like network isolation. Every process can his own, uh, have his own virtual network and uh, be isolated from other processes and also visibility restrictions. Each user could have a home directory completely locked away from other users. So the systemd processes that you will find in almost any uh, modern Linux distributions are systemd itself, which is the uh, startup sequence manager, systemd logindd, which is seat and session management. Uh, remark the small footnote there. Systemd journaldd, syslog, um, but different than syslog. It's not logging into text files, but into binary files, and it needs some front ends in order to see what's inside, and the systemd dbus for service process communication. I tend to remove that adapter. Um, systemd dbus, udev. Um, the systemd controls um, are the part that are quite hard for someone who has used sys5 in it before, because instead of kill and ps, for controlling services or using the etc init.d startup scripts. Now we have uh, service files um, that are started via system control. Start, start the service, stop, stops the service, restart and reload. Sounds similar than uh, those five in it. Reloads or restarts the service. Enable and disable does the same that we did formerly with uh, removing or adding symlinks to um, init files and status shows us if the process is actually running or not. All the system services can be shown with system control list units. And uh, list units files, that's actually the same as if I would do run an ls minus l over the sys, uh, systemd directories. So if we want to have a look on that, System CTL list unit files. Oh, system CTL. Okay, so um, the different endings, uh, we have a table for that too. Um, if you want to find out anything about a special service, um, you can run system control cat on this. Apparently, there's a pager built into that command that I would personally have piped through less, I guess. Systemctl show service shows me, should show me the parsed version. So what systemd actually is doing with that service, while the simple cat command is the same as I would as I would load the service into my VI and check what's being started there. So this is the kind of uh, startup sequence that systemd uses instead of this five in it, if uh, we want to start a specific service or program. Okay, same thing for the logs, which are unfortunately, well, I say unfortunately, but uh, some uh, other administrators think it's quite practical, that are no longer in text format, but in binary format. Journal control shows the systemd logs and uh, minus b for the current boot process, minus k, the kernel messages only, and if you want to see um, logs from a specific service where we used grab before, um, journal control minus b minus u x dot service will show only the logs of that specified x dot service. So uh, I guess you have to use, get used to that 
to um, in order to evaluate uh, your system logs. These are the types of files that systemd uses to manage the system. .target is the same thing that we had in run levels in sys5 in it. .service is the individual file or program that we want to start. Sockets um, related to services define IPC sockets for communication. Config files for systemd's own server processes control um, the uh, features that are started with each systemd service mount are mount points. Auto mount are those that have to be automatically mounted at some point of the startup. Swap are for swap partitions or files. Timer is the integration of cron and add into systemd. So these services also go to the new uh, scheme. Snapshots and uh, slices and scopes are automatically created by systemd and contain the current system state. So uh, there is the possibility of a rollback or of uh, a further analysis. So these are the units. If you want to change or modify uh, something in systemd, you could use VI. Um, the authors recommend using system control for that as well. And even for power of reboot and rescue are system control commands available that uh, use the same GUI scheme um, for everything. So some things about systemd that I find very interesting developments is nspawn for managing pseudo virtualized systems and tasks inside of systemd, um, managing virtual environments from a single front end like Docker or KVM. Um, systemd as an all-round Linux system management solution, so you install one suite and you have all the management commands available that you need for managing desktop systems, and uh, probably much more. <laughs> and now comes the bad part. My very personal problems with systemd is just I don't need any of this. Um, I need something that is very simple, uncomplex, and starts up in a few seconds. And systemd is uh, designed for managing complex systems. So to elaborate that, the complexity, um, if you need a GUI for simple tasks that cannot be done by um, simply editing text files, I'm getting a little nervous because I don't know what to do if the GUI breaks or refuses to work because the socket is missing. And uh, which we will see when we try to remove systemd, um, the invasion of init unrelated desktop software through the new session management features of systemd and uh, its own version of dbus. Also, real hardware is a problem. Um, I just had a mail chat with the, one of the authors of systemd. I'm allowed to say, or um, it is correct, that systemd was not developed with uh, DVD systems in mind. So slow and uh, high latency uh, data is not meant to be for paralyzed system startup. Paralyzed system startup means the laser of the uh, DVD ROM has to move forward and backward, and at the end, only about 5% of the time is spent for reading data, and 95% is just task skipping and uh, moving and uh, mechanical latency. Systemd tries, of course, to parallel tasks as much as possible, and this is a real killer for slow systems. So the target system for Systemd is more virtualized than real hardware, and its developers actually do most of the testing also in virtual environments, which is also true for me. I test Knopix, of course, also first in a virtualized environment, but then I also test on real hardware, and this apparently is not often done for Systemd. So, how can we get back from a system that already has Systemd installed and we want to try um, how is it behaves with Sys5 in it? First, we try the naive approach by just um, removing Systemd and installing Sys5 in it. Those of you who are already laughing uh, have probably tried it before and uh, know what's going to happen. So let's take this uh, Ubuntu that I just started. 
and uh, sudo. First, I install sys5 in it to be fair, otherwise, I would end with no startup system. As you can see from the version number, this is already a sys5 init version that has been patched, so it integrates well with most uh, Debian um, distributions. And now apt get minus minus purge remove systemd. Oops, missed time. So before we hit enter, let's have a look what's going away. <coughs> While the app system is going to be removed, the GNOME tools are going to be removed. Um, LibPem system D, we probably don't need that though. The network management is going to be removed, so we will have no network. Policy kit is going to be removed. That's not good. UDISCs is going to be removed, and what uh, worries me most, Lubuntu Core. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on the plus side, we will free uh, 45.3 megabytes of disk space um, and gain some additional space. <coughs> so let's just do it. Remind you of that RF kill. We will see about that in our second experiment as well. <coughs> so this is the actual warning that comes after everything is done. System D is the active init system. Please switch to another before removing. Well, I should have known this before, but uh, actually I did this by installing Sys5 in it. So. It's done. We are trying to reboot. This actually works because I installed sys the sys5 init package before. Okay, it's booting. The Mysterious 15 seconds at the beginning where I don't see anything are still there, but uh, that's probably not related to system D. So, um, from about here, there, there was the init message. So, actually, sys5 init is in use now. Uh, that's bad. It says that um, the root file system is not writable. So actually, there is a file missing that enables read-write support for the root file system. And we end up at this point um, where we may still get an administrator login on the text console, but uh, X isn't starting anymore. Um, and we get a lot of read-only file system messages. And uh, even if we could log in graphically, uh, the desktop would be gone. So um, as a result, I think we can say system is broken. <coughs> Good. This was the first experiment with no, um, no really surprise in the outcome. So um, we'll just kill that machine. Error minus F, SDA dot Q cow, and we get a new one. SDA one dot Q cow. Okay, um, we need to replug something. I'm just moving around virtual machines in between. Please.
be about two seconds of lag or projector. No problem. <laughs> Okay, so new virtual machine, we start from the beginning uh, with uh, systemd installed and uh, we try a better way to handle this. <coughs> so I'm introducing the magic no systemd package here. dpkg minus uh, e no systemd dot deb. After installing this package, you can uninstall systemd without losing your system. It's a big promise but it really works. Okay, it's booting up again with systemd. Graphics. <laughs> so there we are again. sudo dpkg minus e no systemd dot dev. So now we check what happens if I try to remove systemd. apt get minus minus purge remove systemd. There's still a lot of traffic. Yeah, still Ubuntu core, but that is related to uh, one package called rfkill, which for some reason has a dependency for systemd. So we need to install an, a different rfkill. Which doesn't have that dependency. And now what's going to be removed is just libpem systemd, 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 this 5, and Ubuntu standard, which is basically a config file that says um, which uh, Ubuntu version we actually have. Also, it's uh, installing a new startup system, which is absolutely unnecessary because I have my own, sudo dpkg minus e sys5 in it. Okay, now it just removes systemd like it is supposed to be. <coughs> okay, while it's doing that, I'm explaining why this works. The no systemd package actually contains not a single file, it's just a dependency package. Systemd introduced a dependency package called libpem systemd, which is now required by packages like Network Manager, GNOME Session, and many other Debian packages. And the only purpose of libpem systemd is creating um, a process control group that's actually only needed by systemd. So if I resolve that dependency, providing that dependency lets me uninstall um, systemd without um, running into problems with lots of system software uninstalled. So we are back. It still says uh, systemd is the active init system, but we can ignore that um, all the other services are removed. Now the problem with the read-only uh, root partition still remains, and this unnerving thing keeps popping up, which is no problem. So we need to make our root file system read-write. etc default grub contains the boot options. And there I add 
read write. Okay. Oh, almost forgot. Update grub two. So it's also in the bootloader. Okay, let me think. I exchanged systemd by sys5 in it. I made the read, uh, root partition read write. RFKill has been replaced. Sys5 in it is in place. The link has been in it, should now no longer point to systemd but to my own sys5 in it, everything is good. Okay, we need to wait the usual 15 seconds. Yeah, the result of experiment two is quite promising. As you will see, um, the graphical desktop does start up. We have all our programs available. Apparently, the system boots up, and uh, none of the essential uh, core parts of system D are present. Um, however, it's not the uh, full uh, result that we expect. The system is still kind of unusual, but not as broken as before, pot potentially fixable. So let's check this. So first thing you see is this very ugly error message. No session for PID 911. Wow. 911 is my own process ID of the logged in user and apparently the session was not registered with Dbus. So all the programs that require you to be logged in on the console will not recognize you as the super user or system administrator, which is unfortunately also true for the network manager, which is installed, but which cannot be operated by the normal user anymore. All other pro programs are okay. I can log in, I can do anything I need. That thing keeps popping up, but no problem. So this is network manager running, but as soon as you try to connect to the internet, it gives you also that uh, message, no session found for the user with ID 1000. Interestingly, if you kill the network manager applet and start it as root, connection to the internet works. So. We are not far away from having a functional system without system these um, services, but um, fixing the details can still be a little complicated. So I'm explaining why. First, the RF kill package which we have obser observed has a fixed dependency on a package called systemd with a specific version. My no systemd package just replaces systemd but is not named systemd, so that version information is missing and RFKill still tries to deinstall itself when I deinstall systemd. So, possibility to fix that would be just renaming my no systemd package into systemd and that problem wouldn't occur anymore. Or, what I, which I did, replace RFKill by a non systemd depending version from Debian. By default, the root file system is not writable. We also fixed that by changing read write in etc default grub. Yeah, the session console management, and this is the main point, needs to be reconfigured for libpem if libpem systemd is removed and no systemd login d is running. This is the part of systemd that reg registers user sessions with dbus and. Uh, if that is not running any longer, um, all, the uh, all the Dbus using programs have no idea that I'm logged in and don't know my session ID. And this is why Network Manager refuses to work and why I, why I get um, messages telling me that I'm not actually logged in. So 
This is the effect. No session for process ID. And this has kept me busy for a while, while experts will, of course, remark that this message is totally unrelated to systemd. Well, we have no systemd installed any longer, so it cannot be caused by systemd. Easy argumentation. Some other systems may remark that it is, in fact, caused by systemd session management not used properly. So reinstalling the system manage the, the login management part of systemd would probably fix it. Um, my problem with that is, why do I have to use session management in a single user system anyways? Why doesn't network manager just accept that I am the logged in user and can change the network therefore? So we try a safe removal, which means we have to restart our system again. Kill that one. We'll let that boot up and see what we have to do here. So the next procedure, which is hopefully giving us a really functional system, is first installing the no systemd to get rid of the dependencies of the systemd package, then installing a systemd package that does a replacement of systemd, not just uninstalling systemd, but replacing it without uninstalling the package. So the systemd package remains installed, but it is just unused. Then there's a special package called systemd.shim that keeps dbus happy, because every time a program like Network Manager asks for a session um, over dbus, systemd will uh, start the login manager and add that session to the dbus. As a result, we have a sys5 init, sbin init, because that was, was uh, overwritten by, by the sys5 init package. We are now running a real sys5 init as startup, and uh, the systemd services are still all working fine, and uh, the system will keep running even if I install more systemd dependent packages. So this is experiment number three. Again, as before, dpkg minus e, no systemd. That removes all the hard dependencies. Then I install my specially patched sys5 init Debian package. I leave the other sy uh, systemd packages just as they are. Um, I probably still need to fix the root file system issue. ATC default grub. Okay, looking better back at the instructions. Systemd shim, we need that now. Update grub. Update grub two. Okay, I think I did everything right. And hopefully the system will boot up. 
The leftovers, um, while it's booting up, I'm showing that one. The leftovers that we cannot yet remove at all um, is libsystemd journal zero and libsystemd login zero because there are programs that are linked with those libraries. If I remove the libraries, the programs will be gone as well. For software that relies on systemd dbus replies like uh, the lockout button of KDE, GNOME, um, LXDE, um, they may wait forever for systemd answers, so this is the reason why it's also good to install systemd shim, um, even if you don't use systemd itself. So these packages waiting for dbus answers get what they expect. Okay. So there we are again. What you don't see here is the message that said no uh, session uh, for PID. I wonder a little about the missing um, network manager icon, but that may be related to the startup script that is not linked yet. I'm just starting etc init.d network manager restart. Okay. I'm offline and wired connection one. I'm online. Okay, so everything works and we have a normal sys5 in it running and this is the not the perfect solution yet. I'm still trying to get rid of the other system, the um, components that are actually not used is, um, just for session management. But at least now I have my sys5 in it back on a standard Ubuntu, Debian, whatever system D using system without too much effort. And I can still shut down and restart and uh, use most of sys5 in its features. Okay, alternatives to sys5 init or to systemd. Patch sys5 init that uh, replaces systemd as sbin init, or if you want to try systemd's own version of sys5 init, um, lib systemd um, init is a compatibility package that um, tries to do the same as the sys5 init did before. Install a different uh, startup system of your choice, like Upstart, which is um, said to be dead, but uh, it's still used in Linux Mint. Or using a stripped-down version of Sys5 in it, like the one in BusyBox, if you want to have a really small system. Or compile your own system from scratch with no systemd and no other startup system. Yocto is a very good meta package system um, that um, lets you create custom distributions from scratch. Very simple with no init setups are also possible, like a, sh a single shell script for starting off everything. In the RAM disk, um, if you place a script called Linux at C there, this script is executed instead of init and can start up the entire system which are without needing any startup um, system like systemd or sys5 in it or you use the busy base, uh, busy box um, based setup, or you just write your own respawn service manager or scheduler as a shell script and start this as process number one. So it gets the sick child signals in case the system needs to be shut down or relaunched. Arbitrary programs can of course also be started instead of init. Uh, one um, recommendation or wish for Knopix was uh, to allow arbitrary programs as init like Linux init like uh, equals bin vim. I actually know someone who is using this regularly. Um, don't know if it makes much sense, but it's possible to start Linux just with a single program in single user model as a uh, process number one. Okay, to do for me, um, in order for a complete system deal removal possibility, creating policy kit or console kit setups that do not relay on a session management of registering the logged in user over DBus, or 
Second possibility, registering the logged in user manually, so auto login works and network manager doesn't complain about a missing session ID. In Knopix, what we currently use is uh, we still have libpem systemd and uh, the systemd package is installed but superseded by sys5 in it and systemd shim. So the system behaves like a system5 in it system. Um, still, all the systemd features are working and I can, and can install systemd linked programs without uh, running into problems. I just don't use the systemd um, startup process and shutdown. Okay, so as a conclusion, replacing the system D startup is fairly easy. This was experiment number three, where we just installed SIS5 in it as a replacement and uh, resolved the dis dependencies so system D doesn't complain, leaving everything kept untouched. Removing the system D introduced dependencies uh, always causes side effects, especially on the session management side, and this needs a lot of manual configuration work to avoid those um, messages and errors related to no user logged in. Using the sys5 init emulation of systemd may be an option. I didn't try this yet. Um, maybe the easiest way out. Um, but still, I'm trying the traditional sys5 init package uh, with those workarounds to be able to install both startup systems in parallel. In case someone wants to switch back to systemd, that's just removing the sys5 init package and uh, the symlink has been in it will be replaced by the one of systemd. The effort for maintaining a non-systemd controlled distribution may, of course, increase with systemd's development. Um, I quote here the fact that systemd will never be finished. It will always be expanded by new features, and uh, this will probably also keep me busy to, on one hand, take advantage of these features, on the other hand, trying to maintain my own startup system, which is optimized for slow data and for slow media. So it still starts up quickly without too much parallelization. Okay, that um, was the formal part of the talk. Now I would be happy about the question and answering section. Um, I hope the talk was what you expected. Um, we broke a system two times and we repaired it a third time. So. I'm happy that this worked in some of my experiments. Um, uh, repair was not possible again. Um, still, the problem with the session management remains. Maybe you have a hint for me what can be changed to avoid those messages um, other than reinstalling system D components. Um, questions? <laughs> Thank you for a great talk. Uh, 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 right side. <laughs> Mic is not working. I think if you uh, if you have system running on a hard drive, not uh, mm -hmm. live CD, you shouldn't be doing read-write mount of root file system on the kernel because. Yeah, I, yes, I repeat. I, I, uh, because yeah. your file system checks have uh, no uh, have no way to go. No, you can't run FSCK if you have uh, read write mounted. That's right. That's so you have uh, one more problem. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a big problem for X4, for example. Yeah. Uh, in Knopix, I use the old riser FS. This is quite immune to uh, power breakage or sudden crashes because it uh, during mount it just restores the last known to work state by replaying the last few transactions. So uh, I usually mount my root file system always read write. However, the correct solution, as you would probably propose, is to re-establish the init script that does the read write mount at the appropriate place, right before I need write access for the log files. Yeah, that's of course true. That quick workaround was just for the show, so I can do this very quickly instead of writing another shell script at the appropriate place. Uh, 
My name is Peter. Thank you very much. Your lecture recall when uh, me when I was five and I was still breaking toys. <laughs> Um, and I have one question. In your opinion, does system D adhere to keys rule or uh, other uh, um, systems like upstart? Hmm. It's a difficult question. Every, I think every a startup system has its place. The um, target of system D is a complex system with virtualization, with lots of processes, with a central management console, and for this it's really practical. Sys5 in it um, is targeted to very simple startup systems, maybe even single user systems. Um, upstart is uh, good parallelizing. Um, for my own uh, attempts of uh, creating operating system, uh, no startup systems would probably be the best option because I only need one or two services running and uh, all the others like uh, FTP server, HTTP server and everything else I put in etcrc.local and start them after the main startup process is done. So um, I don't think uh, we should talk about which startup system is the major key account in the future, um, but rather of which startup system is appropriate for the specific um, purpose. Um, I had a talk with the uh, system D developers. Uh, they also see that in very, very memory reduced systems like 64 megabytes or something, you don't want a, start a startup system as well. Um, you just need something that starts up one single process. However, in, on modern um, smart TVs or smart devices, SystemD may come in handy because it brings all the features that you need for system management like um, uh, extended logging, like um, virtualization, um, isolation of networks that you would have to uh, manually insert into system D, into system 5 in it. Um, so I think it just depends on the purpose. I cannot tell you if the choice of system D for most distributions was the, a good or a bad one. Time will show this. I, for my part, will try to stay with this 5 in it or um, BusyBox this 5 in it for a while um, until I see a really advantage of using system D for Knopics, which I cannot see yet. <laughs> Another question? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, front. <laughs> okay. So you told us about the problems uh, with starting the system using System D uh, when booting from the DVD. Yeah. Uh, are those problems related to loading the unit, the non-sequential uh, read? Is this uh, loading the System D unit and parsing them, or is it the later stage of boot up? It's actually the parallel start. If you have two processes that uh, try to start in parallel, the head of your disk will be spinning between two locations. And uh, the longer time it needs, um, yeah. System D should have a load, maybe. You can put a load balancer in System D. So uh, if it detects the media is slow, it will try to sequentialize um, the formerly parallel tasks. Uh, they had that in a former version of System D with read ahead, with uh, optimizations in that direction, but they removed it because they said, well, who is using DVDs uh, nowadays anyways? But I know a lot of people who have old computers. Um, in some countries, the computers that we throw away here will be used in schools for uh, lectures, and they have very slow drives. And they just cannot start with System D because it parallels um, does too many parallel tasks. And also the RAM isn't sufficient for starting too much things at once. So I'm thinking about these old computers and for these I need my manual uh, routine that sequel sequentializes all the tasks that uh, would consume too much latency if they are starting in parallel. So it's not really system D's fault that it is slow on slow media. It's just the fact that it tries to parallelize too much. And putting this to RAM isn't a good idea? Um, putting this to RAM would be a good idea if you have that amount of RAM, of course. Um, Knopix has that two RAM option, uh, which first loads the entire five gigabyte of DVD into RAM and then starts from there. With this option, a system D would be blazingly fast, I think. 
Um, however, I have seen systemd setups where systemd was waiting for a socket that was um, for some reason appearing too slow and it avoided starting other processes before. Um, databases are a good example. Why do you have to need, why do you need a network in order to start a database? It's just about the start. The database could start before the network. You can only access the database after the network is there. So systemd waits until the network is up and then starts MySQL. But it shouldn't have to wait that long. So my way of thinking is the programmer who designs the system knows best what to start in which order and shouldn't rely on customized files that decide this for him. And uh, systemd does a lot of good pre-customization, but sometimes it just fails. And uh, this is the cases where it gets really hard for the developer to look inside and find out at which place it did something wrong. So maybe adding another configuration options to systemd would be a good way to go. Yes, and especially and the possibility to choose your startup system and not to link uh, libraries into programs, fixing them on systemd. So I cannot use Network Manager anymore without some systemd components installed, even if I use a different uh, startup system. That's my criticism, that there is too much linkage between systemd and uh, custom programs. But if you provide uh, your equivalent of that library, uh, you could use your network manager providing your own version of, let's say, mock leap system D and everything yes. should be working fine. Exactly. It's just more effort for me to provide those fake libraries like the no system D package that you have seen. Uh, I would also have to provide a library that replaces all this, the function calls of the original lib, of course, by dummies. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, more questions? I don't see any hands up. So thank you, Klaus, very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs>